So I was asked if I have a presentation up here to, to put up, and I don't, which meets people with great surprise. So for a brief period of time, we'll just distract you with our air.com website, which we built on Spree in about 95 days. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to have to tell stories. And this is a little bit like going to a dinner now where you don't have a cell phone. And it's like, what am I going to do during dinner, during kind of lulls in the conversation when I could be texting? So I'm flying a little blind up here. So if, if we start to lag on the stories, just jump in with questions. Otherwise, there'll be some time at the end. I have a little bit of bad news for you guys, which is you're all wasting your time. E-commerce is a really bad business. And it's really hard. And so I want to talk about why it's a bad business right now. And then maybe we can find a pathway to actually making it a good business by the end of our conversation. So the reason why it's bad, and I wrote a little bit about this online, I wrote an essay called E-commerce is a Bear. And I'd now like to do a quick survey. Don't lie. Raise your hand if you actually read this essay. OK, good. I was actually hoping it was that few. And I purposely didn't look at any Bonobos employees. Um, he, so here's why e-commerce sucks. The primary problem is that it's very, 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 very difficult to make money in e-commerce. And so we have this incredible company called Amazon who intrepidly realized that if you're doing third-party branded e-commerce, you have to be absolutely massive to actually generate cash flow. And the CEO of that company played a really long-term game where a lot of people didn't believe in it, actually burned about $3 billion of cash before they started making cash. Think about that. And a lot of people on Wall Street thought that Amazon was a really dumb idea. But Jeff is a brilliant entrepreneur who understood that if you could be the winner in creating the world's largest store, you would have one of the best business models in human history. And that's what they've got, the world's largest store. And so now I just want to take a quick survey so I know my audience. Raise your hand if you work in Amazon. Don't lie. I know you're here somewhere. Uh, raise your hand if you have worked at Amazon. Okay, there we go. What'd you do at Amazon? Why'd you leave? Sorry? Why'd you leave? Uh, I didn't make money. <laughs> Smart. It's nice in the summer. Rainy. Yeah, it's kind of rough the rest of the year. But Super Bowl now. Okay, what about you? Okay. Why'd you leave? So this is how we beat Amazon. It's because Seattle sucks. No. Uh, so the thing about Amazon's business model is, I don't know if you guys know this, but like they've, they basically have won at third-party branded e-commerce. It's like, for, for a long period of time, they've won. Like, it's like, when the, when, when the essays came out, you know, three, four years ago that said, like, Mark Zuckerberg won the internet based on what Facebook was doing. And you know you could debate that a little bit now, but I actually think he's doing a pretty good job uh, with a very courageous acquisition to, you know, last week. But Amazon has won at third-party branded e-commerce. And so if you're selling other brands online, uh, you're in a little bit of trouble. And the two people, there's two sets of entrepreneurs who have actually built a really great third-party branded e-commerce company out of the United States in the last, call it 10, 15 years. Uh, one of which is Zappos. So Zappos was a pretty cool company. When I was a second year at Stanford Business School, and I had this housemate who was designing better-fitting men's pants, I thought, hey, maybe we'll actually build an internet-driven brand to sell these pants. And we'll come back to why I thought that might work. But part of the inspiration was that Zappos had proven that you could actually sell soft, line, soft goods online. Originally, people said you can't sell soft goods online. It's just going to be like books. And for a long time, Amazon was ruthlessly focused on books. Although if you go back and you read their Jeff Bezos' investor letters back in the late 90s, he was talking about building the world's biggest store even then. And then they moved later and proved other electronic goods could sell. Basically put Circuit City out of business. They're putting Best Buy out of business. In fact, Best Buy is now building e-commerce showrooms for Amazon and operating them. And so they had this vision that they were going to create the winning e-commerce store. And some intrepid entrepreneurs said, you know what, we're actually going to do this in soft goods. We're going to have awesome customer service. 
The service, in fact, was so important that they relocated the company from San Francisco to Las Vegas to be able to focus on that labor force. They had free shipping both ways, rather famously. And they had 365, it started with lifetime returns and then it became 365 day returns. And people said, how are these guys ever gonna make money with this business model? And of course, they never did. They never did make money at a billion of gross revenue they had about 625 million of net revenue and like a few million of EBITDA. So this was like a sub, you know, 2% margin business, take out your CapEx and your cash flow negative. But they built an unbelievable consumer experience. Consumers loved it. Wall Street was never gonna love it. And if Wall Street would, had seen it, they would have done what they did to Jeff, which is they just would have beat him up for a long time until they proved that they either were making money or could make money which is basically what everyone understands about Amazon now. It's like, oh, okay, it's 2% net income, but it could be 5 or 6%, and 5 or 6% of tens of billions of dollars is actually a lot of money. And that's why it's a great stock. If you don't own it, you probably should buy some now. So Zappos was then taken out by who? By Amazon. It's the same thing Zuckerberg did last week. You know, don't, don't worry about overpaying for what could become your competition and unseat you in 10 years. You have to have humility to recognize that you could be beat, and you have to have courage to pay what other people don't think makes sense. And so they went in for a billion of stock and acquired Zappos. And I remember the day very clearly because I had two Zappos engineers who were working at our company. And they, the whole company was built on like anti-Amazon, and now they were being acquired. So Tony, Tony Shea, and Alfred Lin did an unbelievable job with that company in terms of the contagious positive culture that they built. And that was the inspiration to me of how we might combine great service, but with a different business model, which is rather than selling other people's brands, owning our own. Is someone shopping back here, by the way? Is, is like <laughs> stuff getting added to the cart? And... So that was the story there. And I, I don't begrudge the founders there at all for what they did. I think it was smart because the road of competing in third-party branded e-commerce against Amazon is a long and hard road. So then we had a second company of interest come up on the third-party branded side. They focused on a vertical, which was diapers. And they basically figured out that there's some really unique properties to this business of selling diapers. And they built this really cool site, diapers.com, great service. You know where this story is going, right? They built out another vertical, soap. Dot com, they built wag.com, and then they had a moment where it's like, all right, are we going to go raise 100 million bucks and compete against Amazon, or are we going to sell? And Amazon came in, 550 million later, acquired Quitsy, which is the parent to diapersandsoap.com. And so the issue is, is that when you get big enough to be a threat, there's a really smart entrepreneur who's going to come and acquire you. And I think that this is compelling for some people as a, as a business strategy. Uh, the problem is, is that the third-party game is basically been won. And this is what the SA e-commerce is a bear is about. And the reason why it's been won is that if you actually do the math, if you start at gross revenue and you offer an awesome free shipping and returns policy, you're going to have a lot of returns. Then you're going to have your net revenue. Your net revenue against the margins of selling someone else's brand, now you're down to probably 40% of that net revenue. Then you've got these hidden things that like, people don't think about when they're starting e-commerce companies, like the cost of customer service, the cost of fulfillment, credit card fees, uh, all your e-commerce operations that you have to do. So you do all that. Then you've got to market it, right? So you've got the marketing piece. Then you've got your payroll and you've got your rent, right? And what's left is not that much, which is why our industry has been plagued by a weird problem, which is that lots of talk about it and lots of venture capital has flown in, uh, come into it, but we actually haven't had an American-based company go public and reach 10 billion of market cap since 1997 and 1998, one of which was Amazon, the other of which was eBay. So we had one winner in selling third-party branded e-commerce, game over, and one winner in largely, largely winner in peer-to-peer -peer selling is eBay, and then they made a really smart acquisition, which is PayPal, right? So that was their own WhatsApp moment. I don't know if WhatsApp's gonna be a good acquisition, but I think at least it was courageous. 
Until, literally until, this is why this is so exciting, you know, the end of last year when Zulily went public. And Zulily is the first IPO we've had. Standalone, independent company, doesn't need to get bought by Amazon because they can stand on their own two feet uh, to actually get out and be now, I, I don't even know what it is. Does anyone know? Probably not spending too much time on it, but I think it's like seven or eight billion dollar public company now. And as you go through and think about the ways that you can actually compete, there are a few ways that you can. The first is proprietary pricing, and that's the Zulily model, which is we're going to actually offer a better price than anyone else. And there's been a bunch of companies in that category. It's called the flash sale business. I think there's two brands in that category. I thought a few years ago there were two brands that were going to be extremely compelling, one of which is Zulily because they've really created a brand around this children's vertical, even though they're selling other brands. And the other one is One King's Lane. Raise your hand if you transacted on either of these sites. Okay, so we get your wife has. There we go. There's, of course, a bunch of other companies in this sector that have struggled because it's very hard. And my belief is the reason why Zulily and One King's Lane are great is because they're great at brand. It's not just like some temporary relationship with the customer based around price. It's that plus brand. And in the proprietary pricing category, these are some interesting companies. There's another category which I would describe as proprietary experience. And my favorite company in this sector is Birchbox. Raise your hand if you're a Birchbox customer. Okay, we got a couple popping up. Room, room, room full of many male engineers. Not every hand shoots to the roof when you talk about a Birchbox subscription. But what's cool about Birchbox is that they've built a great experience, even though it's kind of third-party stuff, they've built a great experience that really delights the consumer, and they found a very novel inventory management way to do it. By the way, this is consistent with Zulily. Um, just applied to a different vertical. I won't spend too much time talking about flash sale or talking about cool subscription businesses. I'll spend most of the time talking about what we do at Bonobos, which is a third strategy, which is proprietary merchandise. And proprietary merchandise has a couple different ways you can do it. One way you can do it is just offer a narrow and deep selection that's hard to find anywhere else. Uh, and this is a little bit what Nasty Gal does. This is a little bit what ModCloth does. Where it's like, it's so narrow and deep, it really speaks to that consumer. It's third party, but the vendor base is like really small and fragmented, and so you can actually drive an awesome margin. And you can be known for like resonating with that consumer. Notice that those are also great brands. The people have, who have affinity for those brands, they love them. Um, or you can do what we do, which is you can actually decide you're going to own your own brand. And this was the harebrained idea that we had in 2007. And the reason we had the idea was we thought, actually, if you own your own brand, over time, you can't be competed against if your merchandise is great because no one else has your merchandise. And my belief was that you could combine having an awesome customer experience from a service standpoint with having an awesome customer experience from a merchandise and product standpoint. And this was the idea behind Bonobos. And this is the good, uh, this is the good news about e-commerce, which is that even though e-commerce is a bad business right now, it can be a great experience. Customers love it. And so fat, let's rewind for a second back to uh, 19, I was saying 1997, 2007. I have this housemate who has made better fitting men's pants, which is a really weird innovation to think about making. I mean, this is a category that doesn't change that frequently. This part of the conversation is always awkward for me because everyone looks down at like my like lower half. So w once that awkwardness passes, back up to the eyes, please, gentlemen. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is a very cool innovation. And basically what, what Brian Spaley, my co-founder, who's now the CEO of Trunk Club, discovered is that most American men's pants are too boxy. And most European pants are too tight. Right? Like they look good on the guys when they're standing up, like smoking cigarettes at the bar. This is in Europe. Uh, but then when you actually sit down, it's like way up in your business. Right? You've seen these guys, right? So Brian's whole idea was I'm actually going to buy pants that fit my thighs and fit right, and then I'm going to tailor them in in the waist. And that resulted in a pant that is actually built with a contoured waistband. So if you're I don't know if you guys ever do this, but you should try because it it's fun. If you ever buy a new belt, it's straight, and then wear it for like a couple of years and then hang it, and it's actually going to curve a little bit. And that curvature is how our pants are built. And then we 
bundle that with a rise that's not too tight and not too droopy. Most American rises are too droopy, which creates this awful problem that we call khaki diaper butt, where there's just way too much fabric in the seat of the pan. Just like walk down the streets of Manhattan, maybe in a spree conference. I won't ask you guys to get up, you know, stand up and turn around. But it's generally the rise is too long, and that causes like a really uh, too much fabric in the seat. And so if you get the rise just right, you end up with a much more tailored fit in the thigh. And then what we've done over time is we've added to that, and this is only possible because we're internet driven, offering now three different fit silhouette blocks and 36 waist and inseam combinations per silhouette. That, by the way, doesn't make economic sense if you're doing a purely store driven model. And so the belief was that by having an internet driven model, we could offer more fit, more granularity sizing wise within the fit, and tell the story of this brand bundle it with great service. And so 2007, I was pitching this idea to a few different investors. And the question was, well, who's done this before? Who's ever built a brand with the internet as the primary channel? And the unfortunate answer was no one. But in the history of innovation, the past is actually a bad predictor of the future. This is one of the, the weird things about innovation that it's hard to wrap your brain around. And my founding angel investor, Andy Rackleff, who's a co-founder of Benchmark Capital and who's now the chairman of a really cool software financial services company called Wealthfront, calls this being non-consensus and right. And so imagine a two-by-two two matrix. You have, you're either right or you're wrong. And then you're either consensus or non-consensus with your idea. So let's play a game. So consensus and right, Jay-Z, right? Consensus and wrong, the Hamptons. I go there, but it's, I, don't, I don't feel good about it. <laughs> Non-consensus and wrong. Any ideas? Yes, very good one. One of the, one of the worst ones I've ever heard, but in that way, <laughs> one of the best. Non-consensus and right. I agree with that. Bitcoin, I, th I think that's true. But you, you don't know until later if you were right or wrong. So hopefully you're not wrong. So everyone's going to think you're crazy to begin with. But the idea is, is that five or 10 years later, hopefully that's like, wow, that was actually, that person was right. And this is one of the interesting things about innovation is that all great ideas at the beginning are non-consensus. It's just a question of over time, are you going to prove people right or wrong? And if you want to unlock tremendous ec uh, economic value, and you want the joy of being a contrarian who has proved to be right, you've got to be willing to be non-consensus. And so for me, I was looking at e-commerce in 2007. I was living in Silicon Valley, and all this crazy stuff was happening in social. You know, there was this new company called Facebook, which had launched three years earlier at Harvard, and Mark Zuckerberg came to our class and was talking about it. And I thought, huh, that might be an interesting tool one day if they ever put brands on there. There were no brands on there because there were only schools on there at that point. Uh, there was this thing called LinkedIn coming up, and it was like, wow, this, this is going to be like a great way to recruit people one day. Like, you know, digitally driven companies are going to be more advantaged in terms of uh, even attracting talent if they're digital and they're focused. But there wasn't an example of anyone who had built a brand online yet. So I, I thought back to my mercenary days working in consulting in financial, in financial and in finance, private equity, which was, a, those are dark days. Uh, but I got great training. I got to see a lot of companies, and one of the companies that I saw was uh, Land's Ed. So I spent a year living in Dodgeville, Wisconsin when I was 24, which is just awesome in the winter. It's great up there. It's a great time. Uh, and I was working for Sears, who had just acquired Land's End. So Sears, for like 30 years, has been trying to figure out, how do we get this guy who comes in here to buy Craftsman tools and diehard batteries and Kenmore and Whirlpool washers and dryers, how do we get that guy's wife to buy clothes at the store? And they never figured it out. And it's a bit sad, because they actually were pioneers back in the day of the catalog, the third-party branded catalog, when that was an innovation. I can remember getting the Sears catalog and marking it for Christmas presents from my parents, spoiled child that I was. And 
Then they had these great house label Hardlines brands, like Die Hard. I mean, let's just talk about brand names that are awesome. How about we just do Die Hard? It's so cool that they're going to now make a movie franchise with Bruce Willis that shares our name. I don't know what, you know, how that worked. And yet they couldn't figure out the soft line side. So at some point, this guy, Gary, who had built Land's End from the catalog origins to be about a $2 billion catalog, they said, well, why don't we just buy that and put it in the stores? And so I was on the front lines with an Excel spreadsheet of figuring out how do you allocate pink cashmere sweaters to a Sears store. And I did the math, and I looked at it, and I was like, actually, I can't. We, this doesn't make economic sense. We can't offer pink cashmere sweaters anymore. So we started taking all the cool merchandise that was on the edges of the brand. And that's the stuff that makes a brand cool. It's not the stuff that everyone wears. It's the stuff that very few people wear. We, took, we killed that. Then we took the customer service policy. Land's End was known for great customer service. And we said, actually, now it's just going to be kind of the Sears way of doing it. So you're going to talk to Sears reps. There's not going to be Land's End people there. There's not going to be people with contagious positive energy for the brand there. So we take that away. We also had this great return policy. That's gone. We also had a really smart markdown policy, which is like buy skew to the percent off. We're going to change that and go 25 50 75% off. We took all these great things about Land's End, and by changing the service nature of it, in my opinion, destroyed the brand. So I like to say sometimes that Bonobos is an act of atonement because I feel like I took one great brand out of the world. I didn't mean to, but I was part of it. And so we got to put one great brand into it. So I was doing some research in 2007, and I said to myself, well, what, what do people think about Land's End service reputation? And I went to a list of the top 25 service companies of any kind, and I saw two brands on the list that were clothing brands. Everything else was a non-clothing company. The two brands on the list were Land's End and any guesses? L.L. Bean. Bean. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And I started looking at those companies, and I knew a lot about Land's End. And I said, if you could build a $2 billion brand with a physical catalog, it seems to me that the internet is going to be a cool enough medium that you can actually build great brands on the internet. So I excitedly flew to New York to make sure that it wasn't just our friends being nice to us, buying our pants, and that other people actually wanted the product. And I had a duffel bag of pants. And I went to 14th Street to a friend's house, and we laid the pants out on a table. And we invited all his friends over. We put some beers in the fridge. We said, come on over and check out these pants. This was a, actually a pants party. <laughs> this happened. And 14 guys came to the party. Seven guys bought three pairs of pants. Six guys bought two pairs of pants. Uh, I think one person didn't buy said that they would become one of our first 100 e-commerce customers and ended up being like customer number 56. And so I excitedly flew back to California, and I, I, on the way back, wrote a presentation. I was like, OK, people love this product, including non-friends. We're now going to build an internet site, and we're going to tell the story of this brand. We're going to offer this great customer service, and I developed this idea for what would be the ninjas. And the ninjas were going to be our in-house Zappos brand identity, which meant you were going to get energetic and empathetic customer service. Raise your hand if you've ever been a ninja in your life. Wow, we got lots of ninjas. We got all kinds of ninjas. Um, and I went and I met with this guy named Joel. And Joel was a, a storied lecturer at Stanford Business School who has built a lot of companies. I think he's built six companies. He sat on 38 boards. He has seven kids and 17 grandkids. Joel has been very busy. He's in his late 50s, early 60s, one of those sagest human beings I know. And I walked in because he, he took a meeting with me, I think it was at 5.30 in the morning, because that's when he starts his day. So I, I was very caffeinated for this meeting. And I went in and I said, you know, here's this idea. We're going to take these great pants and we're going to put them online. We're going to have an internet-driven brand. And we're going to deliver an amazing combination, not only of great clothing, but great service. And those two things together are going to actually create a bundle that the consumer has never seen before, with the possible exception of these catalog companies. And by the way, they did pretty well once upon a time in the catalog era. And Joel was like deathly silent for the whole meeting. And I was like, God, he hates it. And we got to the end of an hour. And he goes, you know, this reminds me of my first meeting with David Nealman from JetBlue, which is we're going to go into a stagnant industry. We're going to change the rules of the game a little bit. And we're going to be relentlessly focused on delivering a great customer experience. 
He said, how much money are you raising? I said, I think about raising like 300 grand. He goes, how much are you thinking about selling of the company? I said, up oh, 10%. And he's like, oh, that sounds like a valuation of around 3 million. It's a little rich. Uh, if it was like two, I'd be in for the whole thing. But at three, count me in for 100 grand. I was like, Jesus, this guy's already negotiating against me. And I walked out in the hallway and I called my co-founder, Brian Spaley. And I said, you're not going to believe this. Joel just invests in our company. And Brian goes, you're me. And then I went the next Monday and I met with this guy, Andy Ratcliff, who had co-founded Benchmark, who I, who I mentioned to you, who had this idea about being non-consensus and right. And he'd spent most of his career focused on B2B technology companies. And he said, I think I'm in. And I said, great, thank you. He said, I don't know much about consumer brands. That was my partner, Bob Cagle at eBay. Bob was the one that originally invested in eBay. But I love your idea of business model innovation. I love the idea of going around the traditional means of distribution and using the internet to get there. He said, I'm in for 100 grand. So then my third phone call was to our first customer, who was one of my best friends from Stanford, this guy named Brian Wolf. And he was a classmate of ours. And I said, Joel and Andy have both invested. And he goes, you're kidding. He said, can I invest? I said, how much do you want to put in? And he said, 10 grand. And then 40 of our classmates who were customers of the brand all invested. And that was legally very annoying. <laughs> but it was worth it because it meant that our original evangelists who loved what we were doing had some skin in the game. And that was worth it to us. And we, from 2007 to 2010, ended up raising capital from over 100 angel investors before there was any institutional capital belief in this idea. Because from the beginning, and even still, people didn't know what to make of this. Is this a clothing company or is this a technology company? Well, this is a technology-enabled clothing company. But the world has not yet seen many of those. And so I flew to New York, back to New York, with 400 pairs of pants, put them up on the walls of my bedroom at 17th and Irving. We literally rolled down this street, 23rd Street, with a shopping cart from Home Depot. If you pay a guy at the door of Home Depot 10 bucks cash, you can have the cart. This is a true story. And we had the shelving, and we were just, brrr, you know, just me, my buddy Jason Torres, and his uncle just rolling down the street with a shopping cart full of stuff from Home Depot. And by the way, if you do this, nobody in New York cares. <laughs> oh, yeah, those are the guys with the Home Depot shopping cart just brrr, rolling down the street. And we literally just took it all the way down to 17th and Irving, and we put it up on the walls of my bedroom. The guy, the uncle guy, put it up in like eight. I've never seen shelving go up so fast. We put the pants up on there. And then we pressed play on the website. And we built the website on a software system called Xcart. Raise your hand if you've ever worked in Xcart. God bless you all. The Xcart, I think, was built by the KGB in the late 60s <laughs> in, a, in a cave in, near Sochi. This is not the best e-commerce framework invented in the history of mankind. This was the beginning of bonobospants.com. Cost us $19,500 to build the site. Uh, about 4,800 of which went through a designer who I had negotiated down in San Francisco, a guy named Brandon from B-Trax. God bless him. About 10,000 went to a PHP developer who lives somewhere in Arizona who I still have never met, named Brett Brewer, but who is still sometime. He does. Okay. I thought maybe he'd be here. Brett Brewer and I never spoke um, over anything but like chat. But he built the original site, and then we had another few thousand for instant else, and we pressed play on that site. And we did 10,000-ish of sales that October, 19 in November, 30 in December, about 31 in January, all the way up to around 300,000 in that following December. So we did about 2 million of revenue our first year, sold 12,000 pairs of pants, acquired 5,000 customers, had about a 40% repeat purchase rate, and we proved, God damn it, you can sell pants on the internet from a brand that no one has heard of. And we had a lot of work to do um, from there. And over the course of the last six years, um, we've expanded. And we have been trying to address these two fundamental issues uh, with branded e-commerce. And there's, there's basically two problems. I'm going to give you a complicated business framework. Problem one is customers. And problem two is costs. And so the customer problem. The issue is, is that paid marketing online sucks. Paid spend, advertising to build an internet business, if no one's ever heard of the brand, is not a very good strategy. Most of the companies that tried to spend a lot of money to build a lot of customers have largely been discredited. 
Many of them raise large sums of capital. Many of them are in the process of going out of business. The problem with branded commerce is you can't just use Google. Google is not your savior the way it was for third-party commerce. It's not about catching demand. It's about creating demand. You know, on October 2007, the day that I launched Bonobos e-commerce, no one woke up in the morning thinking, where am I going to get some Bonobos pants and Googling for it? Because no one knew what it was. And so there's another essay I've written about this called Startup Drugs that talks about this problem. You basically get hooked on crack, which is you raise money to spend money, and you end up in this cycle where you're actually never going to make money. It also turns out that you acquire more and more inferior cohorts of customers over time. Because customers that you have to pay for and discount to are not as good as the customers who just love what you're doing organically or through word of mouth or through editorial PR or through just thinking, hearing that the experience is great. So we have, we have created a solution to that problem that we never uh, anticipated. We couldn't have been smart enough to envision it. Certainly not me. And it started in the following way, which is we thought, you know, maybe we'll build a direct sales force to tell people about this product. And so we put two fitting rooms in the lobby of our Bonobos office, which is now, we're now on our fourth or fifth office from that apartment. We're at 25th Street and 6th Avenue. We've got about 200, we just crossed over the 200 employee mark. And we put two fitting rooms in the lobby. The idea will train a direct sales reps and we'll build like a cool direct sales force. Within about 90 days, we were doing a million of revenue run rate out of our lobby. And we had this mind-blowing insight, which is people like to touch and feel clothes before they buy them. <laughs> An earth-shattering insight brought to you by Bonobos Inc. But the thing that was crazy about it was that something I had always been told by people who understand what I just said is something that I agreed with when I heard it, which is that instant gratification is important when it comes to buying clothes in person. And it turned out that our customer didn't care. People are busy. They've got to go to dinners so that they can text while they're bored. <laughs> i got dinner to go to. I don't need to carry my bags with me everywhere I go. And so people were happy with a great human experience in person because we have a world where there's not great human connectivity. The average vertically integrated brick and mortar store, you have an experience with a human being who you've never, you're never going to see again. And so you take special care to not form any kind of interesting human connection with them. And sometimes when they approach you and ask you if, if you want something, you're like, ooh, no. Like, why would you offer to help me? Because you're in a mindset maybe of just you want to go about your business. Once in a while, you're delighted by an experience. And there are a few firms that still get this right in terms of in-person experience. One of them is Nordstrom, who we decided to partner with as a result of that and make that our one flagship, flagship wholesale account. But what we discovered in this lobby was something that we now call the guide shop. And the guide shop is basically, in my belief, the future of the retail store. Uh, it's 1,000 square feet. It's three to five dressing rooms. And it's an amazing one-to-one -one experience. You can touch, feel, try on the product. You can figure out your fit. You never have to think about size again. And then we ship the product to you. And when you come back, over time, as we get better and better on the technology side, you should have a seamless experience where you just don't have to think that much about whether it's going to fit or not. And we now have eight of these guide shops. We have a plan to double that number this year. We have two in New York. If you want to check one out, you can come to our office at 25th and 6th. You can make an appointment online, or you can head down to Crosby Street between Broom and Grand. And we envision a network of 50 of these guide shops over the course of the next three years. And they are stunning. They are the only thing at the company that has a net promoter score almost as high as the ninjas themselves. And we've gotten pretty nerdy about measuring net promoter score. And for any of you who are launching a business, I encourage you to go try out Caleb Elston's company, Delighted, which will provide you with a weekly net promoter score summary, which is critical to think about how consumers think about what you're doing. And we've done a lot of other things. We actually have done this crazy innovative thing, which is a print catalog. We stole that trick from uh, Land's End. That's our second best customer cohort. The third piece is all the great word of mouth and editorial PR that we get from having such a great bundle of service and clothing. And we've taken the paid spend in our business, and we've taken that down to under 10%. And so now we actually have a good business, which is exciting. And so we solved the problem that I presented you with at the beginning, but it took six years. It took 66 million of paid in capital. And this is the other thing you should be aware of as you're building your e-commerce business, is that you're going to need money. 
it's really easy to have a great e-commerce business when it's two million. The hard part is how do you how do you scale up from there? And that results in the that's the second piece of the business framework, which is not just an awesome customer acquisition strategy that doesn't cost you much, but it's the pure cost side of the equation. And one of the challenges we've had on the cost side is technology. Te technology is expensive. You can either rent a solution from a company that focuses on renting you e-commerce software. Their primary objective is to make a margin on bad software, which is a devastating combination. Or you can take something and do it yourself, an e-commerce platform such as Magento, which isn't everyone's favorite. And you have a stack that then no engineer wants to work in. So you either have a cheap solution that actually you can't do that much with, or you have like, you know, a hosted solution that's you can spend a bunch of money on it and not have to hire. Either way, you have a problem, which is you don't actually have technology as a flexible lever at a lower cost to, to actually do good stuff with your, with your e-commerce. And so I've been thinking for years, someone needs to actually build a great e-commerce stack and just make it free. It seems like there should be like an open source answer in e-commerce. And then I met this guy, Sean. Where's Sean? Sean's a crazy man. So the cool thing about e-commerce is you need like a crazy visionary who's going to make sure that it's awesome. And then you get all these people all over the world collaborating on making something great and having it be free. And that is a fundamental renovation to how e-commerce is done. It's why I'm standing up here. Not just because we're using it for air.com, but because I feel like this is the future of how e-commerce should be built. And it's totally changed our company. You know, we've had this six-year problem to solve, which is trying to find a technology team that are actually great software engineers who like their jobs. We could find the software engineers, but they couldn't, they couldn't like their jobs. They liked the company, but their actual work sucked because they're in a bad stack. And Spree has saved the day. And I think we're in the early innings of that. And so the moral of the story is um, e-commerce is a bad business. E-commerce is a great customer experience. I think it can become a great business with hard work and ingenuity. And luckily, Spree Commerce is here to save the day and solve the problem. Time for some questions. as to what your initial approach was to editorial PR, because I know that was pretty crucial to getting the word out early on for you guys. Did you hire a firm? Did you do it in-house? Was it a little bit of luck, a little bit of both? The editorial PR thing is interesting. There, there's this, um, there's actually a pretty good book. I hate business books, <laughs> but there's a few good ones. There's like four. One of the four, one of the best business books is Moneyball because it's about baseball, which I love. Uh, but it's about the value of data beyond you know, how data can trump human intuition or inform better human intuition. Another one that I like is Made to Stick. Oh, I've read that. And I, I think the people sometimes think, I'm going to start a company and I'm going to get PR. It's not doesn't necessarily work that way. You have to serve your customer as a company if you want to get PR, and your customer is a journalist. Right? Yeah. You, the PR firm that you might hire, you're their customer, but the customer to the story is a journalist. And if you think about you like, journalist needs a good story. And if you want to figure that out, like watch that girl on House of Cards. Like she d dismisses some of uh, Frank's stories because she's like, there's no story here. Yeah. So you got to kind of think from that person's perspective. And so, you know, we did a lot of stuff. I mean, we had better fitting pants started by two guys who weren't in the industry. 
We named the company after a promiscuous chimpanzee, <laughs> which, is a which is a great start, right? Uh, our distribution model was internet only, even though the premise of our model was that the pants fit better. Yeah. And you can't try them on, but don't worry, it's fine because we have free shipping, 365-day returns, and our customer service ninjas. And then I think you as a founder have to be prepared to just sell that story. But it can't, they don't care if they don't like your pitch, right? Sure. They have to genuinely want to write about you. And I think that equation is hard to get right. But if you get it right, it's a huge unfair advantage in building a company. So I mentioned being over in Union Square October of 07, launching the company. We got a press hit in Urban Daddy that November, and I was in the Heartland Brewery and Cafe, which is not a restaurant you ever need to go back to, in Union Square, and I got a call, hey, your website's down. And that was our first $2,000 day. And then Uncrate did a piece on us, and Cool Hunting did a piece. And then one day we had a press hit from the New York Times that Google Analytics suggests has been worth, at this point, over a million dollars to us. It's a million dollar press hit. Just direct traffic. Yeah. So it's something that's critical, I think, if you're building a brand, and you have to actually be doing something newsworthy. Yeah. Right? So if you're not getting PR, the problem isn't what PR firm do you hire. The problem is your company isn't that interesting. And I think it's hard for people to think about, well, my company's not interesting. But you can always you know, just do a new company. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Kind of a product question. Uh, developing, a, developing a brand that people enjoy and want to be a part of, they get enough pants, then you face the pressure to expand into other parts of wardrobe and so forth. How do you resolve that pressure against wanting to like stay true to that initial catch, that initial hook of better fitting pants? This was a big fight at our company, which is like what categories should we move into or should we not move at all? And the fight was getting annoying to me because I actually didn't know. And this is one of those things you know you have in life where depending on what narrative you hear in your brain, you can be persuaded of either point of view. And it's like, how do you decide? And often, uh, if the company has more than a few people or there's other human beings involved, it's whoever you talk to last that made the most compelling point. So uh, you're like the president from House of Cards. To continue your House of Cards. Yeah, that's right. It actually, not to, not to do much too much lionizing of Jeff Bezos and before... I get off the stage, I'll talk about how we take, uh, how we take Amazon down. It's going to take a long time. But my view is uh, something I want to share just briefly. I'll say right before we get out of here. So um, Josh will tell me when there's one left. But um, I think you resolve those debates by experimentation. Because what no one can argue with is if something's working, if they work at a company, they want it to go well. And so the debate about whether we have direct sales was like a weird debate at, the, at our board level of like, hey, this is an e-commerce company. The whole premise of Bonobos is e-commerce. How are we going to have in-person sales? And I said, I, I think actually this is a menswear experience company. It's a bundle of both. But I understand that you invested in an e-commerce company. Let's resolve our differences by testing it. And when you're doing a million of revenue out of your lobby with virtual, you know, very low incremental spend, it's a compelling argument. And then we went from there. For product extension, we did a survey. I said, I'm tired of us saying what our brand is. Why don't we ask our customer what they hire us for? And I have a belief that customers are extremely busy, and therefore what they do with brands is they hire brands to do jobs. You hire a brand for a job. I hire Todd's for shoes. I hire Bonobo's suits now that we have them, right, to wear a suit. I hire Chipotle when I'm hungry and I want to eat somewhat healthy and I get this weird bowl, paleo bowl thing that I do. Right? I hire Dr. Pepper if I have a bad hangover about once a month. It's so good. It totally fixes hangover. So the question is, is what job were Bonobos hiring us for when we just had pants? So we did a 1,000-person survey, and I spent the weekend reading all 1,000 replies. And then I had an intern do a word analysis, and there were three words that fell out with startlingly, startling outlier frequency. Fit, service, and fun. And I said, okay, fit, service, and fun are our brand pillars. Why? Our customers, our thousand best customers told us they were. And so we said, well, then how do you actually make fit work in shirts? And we spent three years iterating on making a standard fit shirt that isn't a dress. If you go to Brooks Brothers right now and you buy a classic fit shirt, you can wear it with a belt as a dress. Or your wife can wear it that way. Or you can wear it too. Don't tweet that. 
Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Don't tweet that. Don't tweet that. This is for us. Not everything is for the whole world. And I'm serious. I'm, watch I'm watching you. Uh, and so we had a mandate. We thought if we developed a great fit. And only it took us three years to launch dress shirts properly. We just did it 48 hours ago. So we now have three fits. We have a standard fit that's slimming. We have a slim that's a true slim. And then we have a slim tailored with darts in the back for that guy who you know who you may be who likes to paint his shirt on or who can. And then we have 18 neck and sleeve combinations and we have three collars and it's basically like mass customized dress shirts except you get it the next day rather than waiting for a couple weeks, right? So that took us a long time but we ultimately resolved it by asking our customers. Andy, why don't we do one more? Oh, is that my closing point? Well, we can do yeah. one more question. One more question. Point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know you. What's up? What's up? <laughs> um, so right now, about 85% of commerce is still transacted offline. Um, and that's pretty huge. And even though the online revolution is coming, I personally like to look to what's going on offline as inspiration to what to do online. And when we look at offline sales, we look at the top 50 retail brands that are doing the most business in brick and mortar, only nine of them would be considered vertical retailers. The rest of them are what you call third-party third party brands. Yeah. However, you seem to be pretty down on third-party brands online. And I just want to kind of pick your brain on that and see why you think it's different offline. Ooh, it's a fun one. So unlike music, you can't download clothing. <coughs> if you could download clothing, I mean, when, when downloading music happened, you had you know, Tower Records and Coconuts were toast and gave way to this juggernaut of you know, I, iPod plus iTunes. And then someone figured out how you could stream music and figure out the rights, and now you have like Spotify as a potential disruptor to, to Apple on that flank. Um, clothing, because you can't download it yet, I don't, if you can print me a better fitting dress shirt, please call me. <laughs> um, and so the, the existing incumbents can adapt because the industry isn't going to change as fast. Unlike, say, books, where like, it's a hu it's a pro you can download a book now. And if you can receive the product digitally, that's a different business than if you can't. Um, and so existing players are able to do a great job with e-commerce because they have time to adapt. And I know this from watching our partners at Nordstrom. Nordstrom.com is bigger than any other e-commerce business in this room and is pretty good in terms of this experience that they're offering. Like that that company's going to win because they're going to figure out the mixture of online and offline. And the offline piece, you know, Mark Andreessen, who I love, uh, particularly on Bitcoin, I don't love on retail. He says, like, software is going to eat the world, stores are going away. Stores are not going away. Stores are just shrinking as a percentage of the total. There are going to be fewer, and they're going to be awesome for consumers because they're going to be more experiential. And the pioneer in this was Apple, who had a combination of people and product that basically charts the way for what we're doing with the guide shop. And I got to talk to Ron Johnson recently, and he talked about people and product, and the inventory is not important. And I was like, wow, the real pioneer in Bonobo's guide shops is the Apple Genius Bar. We're just, we're just following in, in, that, in those kinds of footsteps. So back to your question about third party. Third party branded commerce is just hard because the incumbents are going to adapt and they have physical distribution, which if they do right, uh, is compelling. And I, so I think you can do it. Birchbox is an awesome company and is third party. But you gotta be, you got to kind of be genius about what you do, right? You can't just be playing, you can't play the same game that you can't do it the, you know, the, the Amazon way. you got to create a great experience somehow within a niche that trumps that third party branded low cost model. And then you have to be content with your niche because by definition, being niche is a part of your strategy. Unless you can figure out how to jump into other niches somehow. But that's hard to do. So it depends on the size of your ambition. And this brings me to my final point, which is that there is an unsolved problem in e-commerce that I need you all to work on with me, which is that Customers still love shopping multi-brand 
even though brands love offering mono brand distribution. So every brand wants their own store to be the coolest place in the world. But if you look at where customers vote with their feet, they want to shop across multiple brands. Because as much as they love your brand, it's not the only brand that they love. They also like Dr. Pepper and Chipotle. So what I think would be truly disruptive is if you could aggregate eyeballs across all these brands that own their own distribution, a confederation of vertically driven brands. And that's why I think Spree is so exciting, because we have to all be on one great stack to figure out ways to do that. Uh, and if there's a stack that actually is permeating across and it gets better and better and bigger and bigger and acquires its own kind of a network effect, then all these brands can strike back at the bear. Thank you very much.